Modernity is the key force that's shaped the making of modern Asia. Modernity and modernization have arisen in the context of industrialization, and inherent to modernity is a rejection of the past and an embrace of enlightenment rationalism. Modernity envisions a perfectible future based on scientific and technological progress. It's a worldview of individualism, of reductionism and separation, with social hierarchies that are radically different from those of the pre-modern societies that it supersedes. Modernity is rupture, and rupture is the story of this video. Here, I'm going to argue that the division of Korea in 1945 was the result of the rupture of a millennia-old political order by the interrelated phenomena of Japanese colonization and modernization. To make this case, I'll start with a brief outline of the social structure of 19th century Chosun. Chosun was the name of Korea for nearly 600 years during the Yi Dynasty, which ended with Japanese annexation in 1910. Next, I'll describe some of the dynamics at play in the collapse of Chosun and the collapse of the Yi Dynasty in the late 19th century. We'll explore the Japanese occupation and the degree to which the colonial period deepened the rupture with Chosun and Korea's pre-modern past. I'll conclude by pinpointing specific areas where this great rupture influenced the trajectory of Korea's decolonization experience. Prior to 1945, Korea had been a single unified political entity for over a thousand years, dating back to the establishment of Koryo in the 10th century. This is where the name Korea comes from, Korea being a bastardization of Koryo by Portuguese traders. The Chosun dynasty came to power in 1392 through a coup by the legendary figure Yi song -ge. By the late 19th century, Chosun under the Yi dynasty had been established for over 500 years, which is a remarkable run of political stability. Chosun was nested within the Sinocentric tributary system. This was the regional political system of East Asia that predominated prior to the importation of the European state system, the system that now covers the whole world, which was exported by the European colonial powers. This map here from 1809 illustrates Chosun Korea as a tributary of Qing Dynasty China. As a tributary state, the Chosun King paid fealty and submission to the Chinese Emperor and offered a tribute, which was a, re a regular tax paid to the Chinese Emperor as a demonstration of that fealty. In return, Korea was for the most part left alone by China to administer its own affairs. Chosun society was organized in a system which we know as agrarian bureaucracy. Now, agrarian bureaucracies have some similarities with European feudalism, but it's also a, a distinctive system in and of itself in some important ways. Chosun's agrarian bureaucratic structure was divided into five basic levels. Now, this is not just a class system. This structure illustrates a complex web of economic and social relationships. At the top of the society was the king, who could exercise absolute authority and had ultimate say in all matters, followed by the other members of the royal E family. And we can see members of the royal family depicted here in the late 19th century. The next level down in this social stratification was occupied by the Yangban aristocrats, who worked mainly as civil officials, military officials, scholars, and other high level positions. The Yangban were educated landowners who'd completed an examination to gain their rank, which was also semi-hereditary once it was achieved. So once an individual Yangban had passed the civil service exam, that rank lasted three generations in the family without another member of the family having to pass the civil service exam. The Yangban were exempt from military service, but they could also collect taxes from their tenants so the people that lived on their land as bonded labour, both for themselves and for the government, but they were not themselves subject to taxation. Their roles as administrators and tax collectors for the Chosun government gave the Yangban considerable power. 
If we look in the photos here, the young brown are clearly visible in these images by their distinctive black hats. After the Yang Ban, the next social strata down was occupied by people known as the Chungin, or middle people, who were technocrats or the illegitimate children of the Yang Ban. The Chungin hadn't completed the examinations necessary to gain the title and status of Yang Ban. Nonetheless, they enjoyed a life of relative privilege and were exempted from military service or from paying taxes. Here we can see present day depictions on Korean television of the Chungin from South Korean K-dramas. The next level down was occupied by the Sangmin, or common people, who worked in numerous professions as craftsmen, farmers, fishermen, laborers, merchants, or farm peasants. The Sangmin comprised approximately 75% of the population, and they were the productive backbone of Chosun society and economy. The Sangmin were subject to military conscription, so these were the foot soldiers of the Chosun army, and they endured a heavy taxation burden which amounted to as much as 50% of their income. While it was possible for Sangmin to be upwardly mobile and to take the civil service exam, the burden of military conscription and the taxation burden kept most of them in poverty and made upward mobility very difficult for members of this group. The people occupying the bottom strata of Chosun society were called the Chomin, or low-born or despised people, and this group included slaves, servants, concubines, beggars and nomads, as well as Buddhist monks and nuns and shamans. The Chomin were not allowed to live inside towns or to take the official civil service examination, so they couldn't improve their socioeconomic status. This group was considered unclean and were often discriminated against viciously by the upper classes. This agrarian bureaucratic social structure began to break down through the 19th century. Over this period, the monarchy became irreparably weakened. The young band became more powerful, but also more insular in the face of pressures from foreign powers. And we also saw agitation from below, as traditional social roles were undermined by the encroachment of modernity and foreign ideas. This agitation from below took form through a series of peasant rebellions throughout the 19th century, culminating in the Donghak movement and the Donghak Rebellion of 1894. The Donghak movement began in 1860, founded by a bankrupted aristocrat named Che Jie U who preached a religion that combined a unique mix of elements of Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Korean shamanism, and Roman Catholicism. The movement was based on a call for social reforms, uh, shaped by ideas of class equality and anti-Western nationalism. The Donghak movement culminated in a widespread peasant uprising. The Donghak Rebellion did usher in a brief period of modernist reformism in Korea, but as in China, it was too little too late to prevent dynastic collapse and eventual annexation by Japan. Insularity and political instability from below was compounded by political intrigue at the top within the monarchy. The competition between the young King Kojong, his wife, Queen Min, and his father, the regent Taewongon, who ruled Choson until Kojong came of age, is an epic tale of self-destruction at the top through the late 19th century in Choson. This intra-family competition was fueled and exploited by foreign officials from China, Japan and Russia, all of them jockeying for position of influence in Korea. It's in this context that Choson was so ill-prepared for the challenges brought from outside by the Western powers and also from newly industrialized Japan, which at this time was rapidly emerging from its Meiji restoration as a great power in its own right. It's important to understand that the great rupture occurs here. So many momentous changes occurred in Korea over the 20th century from Japanese colonization to the partition of Korea in 1945 and in the Korean War and beyond. However, 
Those events took place as consequences of a more important rupture point around the turn of the 20th century with the collapse of the Yi dynasty and the demise of Choson. Along with the crumbling of the Sinocentric tribute system in East Asia, of which Choson Korea was a part. But it's not just that the political order collapsed. The entire structure of Choson society crumbled around it. A new social structure was shaped by the Japanese during their occupation of Korea, and then reshaped through the birth and evolution of South and North Korea. The disequilibrium of this rupture of the old order ripples out across the 20th century as rapid and comprehensive socioeconomic change, and these, riffle, these ripples still buffet the region today. When an old social order collapses, something else must emerge in its place to fill the vacuum. And for a time, that was the Japanese occupation. The occupation scraped away the remnants of Choson as a viable political system and ensured that there could be no reversion to the dynastic succession post-liberation. It created the internal socioeconomic antagonisms that helped to solidify the division of the peninsula, the division of the peninsula from 1945 to 1950, which eventually exploded as the Korean War. The occupation also embedded modernity in Korean society and laid the foundations for the later industrialization and material development of both South and North Korea. It's not just that the Japanese took power in Korea. As in most colonial regimes, they deliberately attempted to erase the old order. First, there was the obvious reality of Japanese troops on the ground, exercising control over the Korean population by force. But the method of colonial control went further. This photo here shows the Japanese colonial headquarters in Seoul, which was built on the grounds of the Kyungbokgung Palace as a symbol of domination. After the death of King Kojong, who was the last Korean ruler, the young crown prince was forced to marry a Japanese princess and was sent to live in Japan. For the Japanese, the erasure of the Yi dynasty ensured that the restoration of the monarchy could not become a rallying cry for anti-colonial resistance. The Japanization of media and the education system was another means of social control enacted by the colonial regime. We start with media censorship. So early on in the occupation in 1907, the Japanese instituted the newspaper law, which outlawed local publications and ensured that uh, the Japanese media narrative would predominate. Public education was mandated to be conducted in the Japanese language rather than in Korean. Koreans have their own alphabet called Hangul, which is a phonetic script and it's one of the great cultural innovations of human civilization over the last five to six hundred years. Nonetheless, use of Hangul was outlawed and all documents were written in Japanese. In 1940, the Koreans were told to give up their Korean family names and were forced to take Japanese surnames. Children couldn't go to school and adults could not get jobs unless they changed their names to Japanese names. The attempt to erase Korean culture was an attempt to undermine the threat of Korean nationalism as a mobilizing idea for popular resistance. Crushing Korean nationalism became an especially pressing concern for the Japanese colonial government after the March 1st movement in 1919, which was the first large scale popular uprising against colonial rule in Korea. And you can see photos of the March 1st movement. This is the gathering in Seoul. Uh, from that day in 1919. The document illustrated here on the left is the Korean Declaration of Independence, which was read aloud to huge crowds in Seoul on March the 1st, 1919. Think through the implications of this assault on Korean culture. It all but severed the cultural connection of the Korean people to the heritage of pre-colonial Chosun. While Korean culture has been remarkably resilient through the dramatic changes of the 20th century, enough of a cultural vacuum was created to make space for transformative ideas of modernity and modernization, even when the Japanese educational system that they arrived through melted away after 1945. 
The socioeconomic order of Chosun Korea and its stratification of society was completely upended by the demands of the Japanese Empire. Many men were sent to Japan to work as forced laborers, while many other Korean men were conscripted into the Japanese Imperial Army to fight for Japan in Manchuria and China. And it's interestingly, many officers in the later Republic of Korean military were previously members of the Japanese Imperial Army. At the same time, many Korean women were forced to become comfort women or conscripted sex slaves for the Japanese military. The organizational logic of militarization also changed Korean society. The Prussian-inspired regimentation of the Japanese Imperial Army provided a blueprint for the later militarizations of the ROK and DPRK, which also shaped how those later societies were organized at a social level. That garrison-style militarization is still evident in the social organization of both Koreas today. As the American historian Bruce Cummings has argued, there has remained a pattern of strong central power and top-down administration in both the North and the South, which has its origins in this militarizing logic. The occupation transformed the Chosun era economy into something completely different. There was a great appropriation of produce and resources for consumption in Japan and also for the Japanese war machine in Manchuria and China. So the Korean peninsula became the industrial base for the Manchurian expansion of the Japanese Imperial Army. And this had implications for later economic models in Korea post-1945. By the end of the occupation, Japan held almost 85% of all property in Korea of which 83% was owned by the Japanese government or by the large Japanese conglomerates, the Zaibatsu. However, there were collaborationist Korean families who built great wealth during the Japanese occupation as part of the colonial industrial machine. And some of these families became the Chebol in South Korea later on in the 20th century. Industrialization and urbanization transformed socioeconomic relationships across Korean society by changing the material circumstances that shaped those relationships. In industrializing Korea as the base of operations for the Japanese Imperial Army in mainland Asia, the Japanese also transformed the Korean economy from one centered on agriculture to one increasingly built around industry. Now, as a corollary to that, the transformation of key urban centers into European looking cities took place as industrialization brought agrarian populations into the towns and cities to work in these industries. Also, coming back to the education system, it wasn't just that the curriculum was taught in Japanese language. The colonial administration instituted a modern mass education model teaching the technical literacy and numeracy required to produce productive workers and technocrats from modern industrial society. So the economic needs of the society changed and the needs for training the people to run that society also changed, hence the alternative education model. And this is the education model that, that we have grown up with and take part in uh, in the industrial society of Australia today. This was radically different from the education system of Chosun Korea, which emphasized deep study of the Confucian classics. If education is the means by which a society reproduces itself, the type of society reproduced through the new education system would become radically different from that of Chosun. The dramatic transformation of the structure of the Korean economy and the solidification of urban settlement patterns made it impossible for the old order of agrarian court bureaucracy to be reinstated because the material basis for that system no longer existed. The Japanese withdrawal from Korea in 1945 was greeted with great euphoria. As we can see from these photos, we can see the Japanese flag being taken down at the colonial headquarters in Seoul. Uh, which interestingly the US flag was hoisted in its place. We see a street party in front of Seoul Station on Liberation Day and we also see crowds gathering in Seoul to celebrate uh, on the 15th of August 1945, celebrating into 
uh, independence. But this euphoria belies the great challenges that would have come. Enter the Americans and the Soviets. At the end of the Pacific War, Soviet forces entered the north of the Korean Peninsula through Manchuria, while US forces crossed into the south of the Korean Peninsula in short order after Japan's defeat. To fill the power vacuum and to provide a stopgap solution to governing Korea in the aftermath of the Japanese withdrawal, the American and Soviet occupying commands looked for an expedient way to administer Korea. They decided upon an arbitrary division at the 38th parallel. Now there was no geographic, economic or political logic to this line, other than its immediate military expediency. It was roughly halfway, halfway uh, across the peninsula and provided an easy dividing line on a map for the occupying forces. They thought that this division would only be temporary, uh, something to fill in the void while a new Korean government was being formed. It's clear that in 1945, neither the Soviets or Americans knew anything about Korea, and they didn't understand the grassroots forces that were coalescing around the arbitrary political division that they'd just created. Despite the presence of the American and Soviet occupying forces, there was still a security vacuum on the street. In the South, many Koreans who worked for the Japanese regime were rehired by the Americans in a new police force. In the North, new village level people's committees were established to maintain order in the vacuum. But we still had this, this binary between partisans and collaborationists based around who worked uh, day to day uh, with the Japanese regime previously and the people that didn't. So collaborationists were attacked as a whipping horse for the long pent up antagonisms, for long pent up frustrations. And these started to boil over in the immediate aftermath of liberation. There were population movements driven by a kind of ideological cleansing uh, as these antagonisms started to boil over. So we saw people moving both ways across the 38th parallel. There were other population movements making, taking place at this time as well, with Koreans being repatriated from Japan. So these were the people that were taken to Japan as forced laborers coming back. And then there are also Japanese who were leaving Korea to return to Japan. So there's people, the society is in great flux with people moving around everywhere. Liberation from Japanese rule also meant the withdrawal of the Japanese economic network. So in this period, daily subsistence was hard with food, clothing and other consumables in short supply. Now, when life is difficult and when life is uncertain in a society that's in rupture like this, partisan politics takes on a harder edge. The power vacuum opened a space for different local groups and factions to press their political claims. The nationalist leaders of the post-liberation period were united in one sense in their quest to establish Korea as an independent nation state purged of all traces of colonial rule. However, there were many different ideas about how an independent Korea should be governed and who should govern it. In the aftermath of the Japanese withdrawal, there was a mushrooming of a of a variety of political organizations from across the ideological spectrum, including different organizations representing labor, the peasants, representing students, youth, women, religion, and culture, all of whom were actively attempting to shape the emerging post-colonial state. And this was not a benign process. The raw trauma of colonization continued to polarize politics and it was very difficult to find any middle ground. The new post-liberation politics pitted those who'd done well under the occupation against those who were discriminated against. There were scores to be settled and there was no pre-colonial social order to fall back on for stability and for a social anchor. On either side of the 38th parallel, it was land redistribution that became the basis for class-based pro and anti-collaborationist retribution. And this was the beginning of the population displacements and the communal violence. The competing parties on either side of the DMZ 
believe themselves to be the legitimate government of all of Korea and the other as the usurpers. So it's in this power vacuum that was created by decades of rupture that the road to the Korean War and the permanent partition of Korea was paved. Colonization, modernity and rupture. Those are the three key words to take away from this video. If you're interested to see where the story of the two Koreas goes from here, please do check out my lectures from Poll 2 CPA via the link illustrated here. Thanks for having me and all the best for the rest of your semester. 